Hey guys, thank you all so much for joining me today. This is going to be episode 28 of an Old Testament three-piece. We're going to have three stories from the pages of 1 Samuel. These stories are from Eagermeyer's Bible Story book written by Elsie Eagermeyer in the 1920s. Um, I really love this book. If you guys haven't been following along for very long, I have a ridiculous collection of books of all kinds. I love books. I particularly love books um, about the faith. I love Bibles. I love Bible study books. Uh, the older, the better. I love to think about the people who have held them and uh, the spiritual growth that it has nourished in their lives and in the lives of those they've shared with. And it's just a wonderful thing to contemplate and think on. This copy is from the um, 1930s. And as you can see, it's pretty well worn. And I'm not going to lie, a fair amount of that wear has been for me in the last few years. So uh, I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, they're all three going to be from 1 Samuel. We're going to start out with David versus Goliath. So I hope you guys are ready to enjoy that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to come before you today, Lord. Thankful, grateful, and appreciative, Father God, for you waking us up. Thankful for this chance to grow in our understanding of you thankful for this chance to to fellowship by way of social media and the internet and YouTube and all of these different things that we can that we can use for good though they are often used for things that are not for your glory father god we can use them for your glory we can glorify you in our feeds we can glorify you in the content we create we can glorify you in the content that we consume and share and interact with I ask that this video be a nourishment to us, Lord, that it provide a, a fire within us to go and study these scriptures that these stories are based on. Um, I, I would pray that it also be able to capture the eye, the ear, the attention of anyone out there struggling with sin, anyone out there not yet at the foot of the cross, anyone out there fighting against the flesh and addiction and perversion and lust and anger, and hurt, and, and, and worldly foolishness, and promiscuity, and just the, 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 the general melee of filth that is promulgated on us by secular society as a whole, Lord. Um, we pray for a hedge of protection around the lives of, and a blood covering over the hearts and over the minds of children, and the infirm, and anyone unable to do so for themselves, Lord. Thank you for for helping me to put that old man down, Jesus. Thank you for raising me to this new life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for these beautiful people that I get to share this content with and interact with. Thank you for my life. We pray all of this in the holy, just, perfect, and glorious name of your Son and our Savior, my Savior your Savior out there, our Savior, Lord Jesus, in your holy and heavenly name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get into this, all right? I don't want to waste any time here. You guys already know if you've been following along, the idea here is if this story touches you, if it speaks to you, or if you just have the time, dig into the scriptures these are based on. We're going to cite the scripture at the beginning of the story. First story. <clears throat> How David killed the giant Goliath, pulled from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 54. 1 Samuel 17, verses 1 through 54. Hey, let's get it for God and let's go. The Philistines began to trouble Israel again, and they prepared to fight against King Saul and his army. They marched into the land of Israel and pitched their tents along the side of a mountain. King Saul and his soldiers made their camps across the valley from the Philistines on the side of another mountain. But the battle did not begin at once. The Philistines did not seem to be eager to fight. They sent one of their soldiers out into the valley to talk to the men of Saul's army. This soldier was a giant, and his name, Goliath. He called to the men of Israel and said, Why have you come out to fight a battle with the Philistines? I am a Philistine. Now choose one of your men and send him to fight with me. If I kill him, then you shall become our servant. But if he kills me, then my people will become your servants. 
But the men of Israel were afraid of Goliath. None of them would dare to go out to fight against him. How frightful he looked as he stood in the valley before them, nearly twice as tall and wide as any ordinary man. Even the tall king of Israel, who stood head and shoulders higher than any of his soldiers, would have looked tiny beside this mighty giant. Every morning and every evening, Goliath would come out into the valley between the two camps, walking with long strides, and there he would call to the Israelite soldiers, and every morning and every evening, the men of Israel would tremble when they saw him coming. Forty days passed by, and still the Philistines waited for King Saul to send someone to fight against their champion. Now while this was happening, David was busy at home caring for his father's sheep, as he had been before he went to visit King Saul. One day, while he was watching them, he saw a lion spring out of the woods and snatch a little lamb. He hurried after the lion and tried to save the lamb. Then the lion became angry and dropped the lamb and turned instead to attack the young David. But God gave wonderful strength to the shepherd boy, and he seized hold of the lion's beard and killed him. Another day, yet still, a hungry bear came out of the woods and stole a lamb, and again the young David ran fearlessly into it to rescue the lamb, and God yet again helped him to kill this thief. Three of David's brothers were soldiers in Saul's army. Jesse, their old father, thought often of them and wondered how they were getting along. So one day it was that he called David from the field and told him to get ready to visit his brothers in the camp of Israel. Take this parched grain and these ten loaves of bread to them, he said, and take these cheeses to their captain. Learn for me how your brothers are getting along and bring back the message which they send. Jesse did not know that when he should send David away this time, his son would never come back again to take care of his sheep. Bright and early the next morning, David started out on this errand to the camp of Israel. When he reached the place, the sun had risen in the sky, and the soldiers were forming a line for battle. The Philistines were also forming a line, ready to begin the fight. David ran quickly to find his brothers and to tell them about their father's gift, which he had brought to them and to their captain. While the brothers were talking together, suddenly the soldiers around them looked anxiously towards the enemy's camp. Their faces grew pale with fright. As David turned about to see the cause for alarm, he wondered, what can this mean? This is what he saw. Hold on, guys. Here we have a picture, an illustration of David killing the lion. The handsome young lad. A tall giant is what he saw. The giant Goliath. Dressed in clothes that were covered with pieces of brass so that no sword could even touch his body. He was coming towards the camp of Israel again. On his head he was wearing a helmet of brass that fitted closely like a hood. Goliath knew the soldiers of Israel were afraid of him, and he called loudly to them as he had been doing every morning and every evening for 40 days. Remember, 40 is this biblical number of of, of a fullness. 40 days is like a fullness of days. And so this had been going on for a fullness of days, but as we know, it wouldn't go on much longer now, would it? And David heard his voice ring out like an angry peal of thunder, and he saw the soldiers of King Saul turn and run away like frightened sheep. When David saw these things, the very Spirit of God stirred his heart and filled him with courage. Why should this wicked Philistine trouble us, he asked bravely. I will go out and kill him. The soldiers who stood near were surprised to hear David's words. They told him how Goliath had been coming out for many days and how frightened they were of him. But David was firm in his belief that God would give him strength to kill such a wicked man. And the soldiers ran to tell King Saul. Eliab was much displeased when he heard David talk thus with the soldiers, and he called his brothers aside and asked, Why have you let those sheep in the field and come out here to see this battle? But David answered, What have I done that you should be angry with me? Then a messenger came from King Saul calling for David, and now it was that he hurried away to speak with the king. 
Saul had not seen David for some time, and he had never before seen him dressed in the clothes of a shepherd. Now he did not know him. How disappointed he felt when he saw only a shepherd boy come before him with no weapons at all. But David spoke bravely to him and said, Do not be afraid any longer of this giant. I will go out and kill him. You are only a youth, answered Saul, and you are not strong. You are not strong enough to fight against uh, such a mighty soldier as this Philistine giant. But David, David told him how he had killed both a lion and a bear while caring for his father's sheep. And he said, this giant shall be as one of them, for he has dared to speak mockingly of God's people, and God will give him over into my hands. Then Saul was ready to let David go to fight the giant, for he saw that David had faith to believe God would help his people. But David had no armor. David had no shield to protect his body from the giant sword. He had no soldier's clothing at all. So Saul took off his armor and dressed David with it, and put his helmet upon David's head. Then he gave his sword to David, and the shepherd boy looked like a grand soldier dressed up in the clothes of a king. Now you are ready, said Saul. But David replied, I cannot go with these clothes and with this sword. I've never used them before, and I am not prepared to fight with them. So he took them off. He took them off, and he picked up his shepherd's staff, and now it was that he ran down to the brook nearby to find some smooth stones right for the job. These he simply put into his shepherd's bag, and then he took out his leather sling and started away to meet the giant. Goliath? <laughs> well... He was surprised when he saw the young David coming toward him with no weapons. In fact, he became very angry, for he thought the Israelites were making fun of him. He said, Am I a dog that you have come to fight against me with that staff? And he cursed David by the gods of the Philistines, and he cried out, Come to me, and I will soon tear you in pieces, and will give your flesh to the birds and to the wild beasts. But David called back, you have come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel which you have mocked. Today the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and the flesh of the soldiers of the Philistines will become meat for the birds and for the wild beasts, that all people who hear of this for however long may know that there is a God in Israel, and all people will know that the true God does not save with swords or with spears. It was then that David ran forward and took a stone from his bag and placed it calmly into his sling, winding it and releasing it with ferocity at the giant. And the stone hit the giant in his forehead, stunning him so that he fell downward upon the ground. What a crash rang through the valley as Goliath's heavy armor struck the earth. It was then David hurried to the place where the giant lay. The Philistines did not wait to see what would happen next, for now they knew God was helping the men of Israel, and they turned to run back to their own land. They did not even wait to take down their tents or to gather their belongings together, but every one of them started out as fast as he could go. And Saul's army chased after them and followed them to their own country. When Saul and his men came back, they took everything that the Philistines had left in their tents, and there was great rejoicing that day among the men of Israel, for they knew God had delivered them from their strong enemies. All right, guys, so what I will say there is this was... um. This exact copy was not written for young kids, but it was written for sort of that middle ground, what we today would probably call tweens. And so you'll notice that they have left out David beheading Goliath and what goes on afterwards. Basically, what Goliath threatened David with is what David actually enacts upon Goliath as a vessel of God Almighty. Amen. All right, guys, our second story here is how Saul became David's enemy. Pulled from 1 Samuel 17, verse 55, to 1 Samuel 18, 30. That's 1 Samuel 17, 55, to 1 Samuel 18, 30. 
When David went out to fight against Goliath, few of the men in Saul's army knew him. Even the king himself wondered where this brave young shepherd had come from. He asked Abner, the captain of his army, but Abner had never met David before. As the two watched David approach the giant so fearlessly and overcome him so easily, the king told Abner that he must find out whose son this brave young man was. Jonathan was standing near his father when David returned from killing the giant, and Abner met David and brought him to the king. Whose son are you? asked Saul. And David replied, I am the son of Jesse, your servant, who is a Bethlehemite. Perhaps Saul remembered then how this same handsome youth stood before him and played beautifully on a harp when the evil spirit used to trouble him. Now he would not let David go back to Bethlehem to care for his father's sheep any longer. He needed brave young men like that to be in his army. And so he kept David and gave him the command of 1,000 soldiers. And he said that hereafter David should live in his place at Gibeah. Jonathan was glad when he heard his father's words to David, for he loved the rosy-cheeked young shepherd and he wished to become his friend. He took off his princely robe and gave it to David, and he also gave him his sword and his bow. Then he promised David that that I'm sorry, then he promised David that they would always love him, and David was pleased to have the prince of Israel speak so kindly to him. In later years, he realized that God had caused Jonathan to love him so dearly, and he thanked God for giving him such a kind and noble friend. When Saul made David to be captain over a thousand men, the soldiers loved their brave young leader. They were ready to go anywhere with him to battle, for they saw that God was with him. The servants of Saul also were pleased when David came to live at the palace. Everywhere David went, the people loved him. But David soon found out that he did in fact have one enemy. Saul, the king, began to look unkindly upon him. You remember that after Saul had disobeyed God, an evil spirit began to trouble him. This evil spirit came at different times to make him feel unhappy. And now, after the great victory over the Philistines, when Saul was returning from the battlefield with David and the other soldiers, this evil spirit began to trouble him again. The women of Israel came out of the cities to meet the returning army, and they played on three stringed instruments and danced for joy because God had given Israel the victory. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> they sang words like these Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. King Saul was displeased with this song. He saw that the women were giving greater praise to David than to him, and a jealous feeling crept into his heart. Perhaps he remembered Samuel's words that God would take the kingdom from him and give it to a better man than he. Now he saw that God was with David, and he began to hate David. The evil spirit returned to trouble him more and more than ever before. On the next day, David played on his heart before the king again, but this time the beautiful music only made Saul unhappier. He took his javelin or spear and threw it at David, intending to kill him, but David saw it and stepped aside quickly, and the javelin did not touch him. Twice Saul threw the spear at him, and both times David escaped, being unharmed with it. Then Saul was sure that God was with the young man, and he felt even more afraid of David. He wanted to kill him, but he feared to try any more. Now, Saul had two daughters, and this gave him the thoughts of another plan to get rid of David. He called the young man to him and said, I am going to send you out again to fight against the Philistines. If you will fight bravely and defeat them, I will give my eldest daughter to become your wife when you return. David answered that he was not worthy to become son-in-law to the king, but he hurried away to the battlefield, glad that he could prove himself a brave man. Now, Saul hoped that the Philistines would surely kill David because he had killed their giant. But David returned unharmed and with greater honor still as a captain. And the people praised him more than ever, but David found that Saul had not kept his promise. For Merab, the king's daughter, had become the wife of another man. Then Saul heard that his younger daughter, Michal, loved David. And he thought again that he might get rid of him by sending him out to fight against the Philistines. 
This time he said that David should kill 100 of the Philistines. David knew it would be an honor to become son-in-law to the king, and he knew that Michal loved him. So he called his soldiers and hurried quickly to do just as Saul had bidden him. And he killed 200 instead of 100 men. When he returned safely again, Saul kept his promise and gave Michal to be his wife. But he feared David more than ever and tried to think of some other plan, some other means by which to destroy this one who he believed would someday take his throne. All right, guys, thank you for letting me share with you. We got one more here. How Jonathan and Michal saved David's life. Pulled from 1 Samuel 19, 1 to 22. 1 Samuel 19, 1 to 22. And we start with this little excerpt. Wrong thoughts, like weeds, will, quick, will quickly grow. When in one's mind, they're given place. And soon their ugly selves will show to bring their owner much disgrace. At first, King Saul had tried to cover up his wrong thoughts about David. He had tried to act friendly at the very time when he was planning some way to cause David's death, but those plans failed, and he was disappointed. Then Saul grew bolder. He had allowed the wrong thoughts to remain so long in his mind that they had become too big to cover up, too intense to conceal. And so he called Jonathan and his servants and told them that they should kill David. How sad Jonathan felt when he heard this. He loved David. And he was grieved to see his father becoming so jealous and hateful toward him. Instead of trying to kill David, he ran to him and said, You must hide quickly, lest one of my father's servants kill you. He is seeking your life. Jonathan promised to speak to his father to try to persuade him to think kindly toward David. If he will listen to my words, said Jonathan, I will send and bring you again to the palace. David felt very thankful to Jonathan for his kindness, and he ran away to hide in a safe place located outside the city. After he had gone, Jonathan spoke to his father about David and reminded him of the times when David had risked his own life to save the kingdom of Israel from the power of the Philistines' rule. He told him that David had given much brave service to their country and had never done anything deserving of death. Saul listened to Jonathan, and he became ashamed of his jealous feelings. He said, David shall not be killed. Jonathan hurried out to David's hiding place to tell him the glad news, and he brought David back with him to live again in Gibeah. And David appeared before the king as he had done in other days, and Saul did not try to harm him. Soon afterwards, war broke out with the old-time enemies, the Philistines, and Saul sent David out to fight again against them. Once more, he drove them back in terror to their own land and returned from the battle with greater honors than ever. And once more, the evil spirit of jealousy crept slowly but fervently back into the heart of Saul. David came to play on his heart before Saul, but the troubled king did not care for his sweet music. He sat only thinking about how much he wished to be forever rid of the handsome young musician whom everybody seemed to love. Suddenly he picked up his javelin and aimed it at David, intending to strike him to the wall with the sharp point. But David was watchful, and he stepped aside quickly and ran out of the room. Saul was determined to get him now, so he sent messengers to David's home to guard the house and capture David in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, heard that the messengers were coming, and she urged David to make his escape. She let him down from a window, and he crept past the guards through the darkness and ran out into the open country. When morning came, the soldiers told Michal that her father had sent for David, but she said he was sick and could not come. In the night, she had put an image in David's bed and had covered it over nicely, and the bed looked as though a man were lying in it. The soldiers told Saul that David was ill, and Saul commanded them to carry him in the bed to the palace. Saul believed that surely David could not escape if he were ill, but when they came with the bed, Saul found only an image in it, and David was nowhere to be seen. Saul knew his daughter had fooled him because she loved David and wished to save his life. David had run away to Ramah, where Samuel lived, and had told the old prophet about his troubles. 
And Samuel took him into a place nearby called Nioth, where the young prophets lived. Now, Saul was very angry. And he sent through the country to find where it was that David had gone. When he heard that David was with Samuel at Nioth, he sent messengers to capture him there. But the messengers did not capture David. They stayed in Nioth with Samuel and with David and worshipped God at that place. Saul sent other messengers and they did the same. At last Saul said, I myself will go and I will capture David. But when he came to the place and heard the others praying and worshipping God, he had no strength left with which to harm David. He bowed down to the earth and worshipped too. And he stayed a night and a day at that place, but David fled away and hurried back to Gibeah to speak with his friend Jonathan. All right, guys. Hey, thank you so much for letting me share with you guys again. Um, hey, if you're not already, I'd love to have you subscribe to the channel down here. Also, hit that bell icon and you'll get notified every time I drop a new video, which is three long format videos a week, usually, and a brand new YouTube short every single morning at 8 o'clock New Mexico time. Um, you know, guys, I, 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 don't, I don't know what you're going through personally. I don't know what you've been through personally. But I know this. God loves you. Jesus loves you. On his way to the cross and upon that cross, Jesus thought of you personally. I want you to understand that. And I want you to know that he knows everything. Everything we've done. And guys, I have done a lot. 20 plus years as a heroin addict, as a methamphetamine addict, uh, as a self-serving individual, as a criminal at times. But the thoughts that Jesus had in his heart when he thought of us were thoughts of love. Thoughts of wanting to welcome us into the fold. Thoughts of wanting to satisfy and settle our accounts for us because we never could. That way the righteous enmity between us and Father God could be brought to a close and, and, and we could have this Savior, this Messiah to plead our case. Amen. I just want you to know that. Uh, if you guys have any comments, questions, suggestions, video ideas, drop them down here in the comment section. If you have a prayer request, Drop it in the comment section. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you have a witness, you have a testimony. The story of what life was like before, how you came to the foot of the cross, and what's happened since. Tell that story here. Tell that story out there. But tell that story, all right? I love you guys. Father God loves you even more. I will see you all for that next video, all right? Go out there and get it for God today.